tons of other languages that we thought we couldn't get with this restricted kind of grammar that we really could get. So it kind of broke through this barrier of our wrong intuition about these grammars being simple, and we were able to kind of move forward. So I just wanted to put this up as a good example of a recursive gram grammar. How do you interpret this? S can have any strings A's and B's. A and B are also strings of equal zeros and ones. But A is the ones where you have a 0 in front and a 1 at the end. And B is the one where you have a 1 in front and a 0 at the end. And in the middle, you can have anything you want. So if you think about this recursively, you can convince yourself that you could actually get all the equal zeros and ones. But it, as simple as that is, like I said, three weeks just to find the stupid grammar. And, and they can be elusive. And I'm, Did you I'm, have that early, but not realize it didn't? No, no. No, I just didn't think of it. Do you need the Tried everything. It didn't. Pathetic. Why can't you do it in just one line? Why can't you do s goes to 0, s1, or 1, s0, 1, z? You can, but that's not the special kind of grammars that we're dealing with. You can do that. That's perfectly fine. That's another grammar that generates the same thing. That's true. That will give you equal zeros and ones. But here we have two productions on the right that have non-terminals in them. And that's more powerful than the restricted kind of grammars that we were trying to look at. Oh, you're, you're saying you, you start talking about, OK. You're right, right. About no, language. you're right, Michael. If you just want to use context-free languages, there's another one that does the same thing. You, absolutely. Actually, here I think you might need an SS, but I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not sure if you do or not. You have to, you've got to be able to duplicate as many as you want. So maybe you need that, too, right. but maybe not. OK. Like of each other. Right. I, 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 I want to be careful before I say anything. I'm, I, I'm not sure that what Michael first suggested works, but it may. But this certainly works if we add this in. So did you find that there are any languages that can't be described without the power of multiple? Yes, there are some. In fact, we invented, there's a pumping lemma for context-free languages, which is somewhat similar to the pumping lemma for finite state machines, which show things that can't be context-free. Here's an example of a language that's not context-free. Kind of triple counting is not context-free. You can't do this with any context-free language. Okay, So we invented what we called an intercalation lemma. It wasn't really a pumping lemma, but it gave you a way to show that some languages were not generatable by these special kind of grammars. So if you had a candidate language, you could try our little lemma and see if it would show you that it wasn't possible. And there were lots of them that are impossible. And they have certain kind of features. So but, but it's completely off topic. I mean, it's a good <laughs> question, but it's just it's way off on a tangent. I mean, yeah, the, the answer is yes. Story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, it's, it's sitting there. It's, I don't know, the paper is 15, 20 years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this one here is context free, whereas the ones on the right are not? Is that, uh, no, they're all, these are all context free. OK. Th this, is, this is what we call the single tree grammar. If you think about what the trees look, what do the parse trees look like for these grammars? <coughs> There's only one tree you could possibly have. It's just a question of which things disappear. It's a question of where you prune the tree. Okay. Here, you can have really different looking trees. Here, when you get ambiguity, you get ambiguity because the same huge tree just gets pruned in different places. So we call these single tree grammars. Okay. So single tree grammars are pretty well understood now. I know at least of one person who wrote a paper on some open question that we left. Because whenever that happens, the journal editor sends the author of the first paper the paper to referee. So I had to go read that paper and figure out what they were talking about. Um, and I had to remember the open question that I raised, because it was 15 years before and I had forgotten it. But, but at least a couple people have finished up the loose details that we left off. But we more or less, we more or less characterized these and we were done with it. All right, um, one more example, then we'll quit today. <laughs> OK. Chris Walker asked a question a minute ago about languages that you know couldn't be accepted by these grammars. This is a language that can't be accepted by any context-free 
grammar. It can't be generated by any context-free grammar. You can try all you want. You can go home, work all night. You'll never get a grammar that generates that. In the third or fourth day of this five-day sequence, I'll show you a pumping lemma to, to help you prove things like that. But right now, you just have to take my word for it that there's no way, and that if you try, you'll get stuck. What I do want to show you is that if I allow the grammar to be more powerful, if I take away the restriction of context-free, and I allow it to be context-sensitive, that I really can accept things like this. And I want you to see that context-sensitive grammars look very much like machines. They're very powerful. If you can think of a machine computation, you can pretty much simulate it directly with a grammar. And this connection doesn't work quite as well for context-free grammars, but it's an important connection to have. It will eventually give us the connection between computation and grammars. We had it with finite state machines and linear grammars. We're going to have it again now as an example. And the relationship between context-free grammars and machines is complicated. So this is kind of a good warm-up for it. OK. Now, this grammar is long, but it's not complicated. It's just long. We're going to finish this example, and I need to motivate it first. Here's how we're going to generate these kind of strings. Think of an amusement park. Those amusement parks where you know, the guys try to sucker you in to put five bucks down on some game that you can't possibly win. And uh, one of the games they have is you know, some shooting game or some throwing game where some things move along this way. And then they turn around, they move along this way, like those shooting ducks. It's a long analogy that I probably don't really need. But the, the, this grammar that I'm doing, imagine that it's going to move left and right like a shooting duck. Ding, ding, ding. And as it goes left and right, it's going to do all the important things. Does that help? I don't know. <laughs> L and R are the left and right ends of the shooting gallery. D is the duck that's going back and forth. A, B, and C are non-terminals that will eventually respectively turn into 0s, 1s, and zeros. As will be the zeros on the left, Bs will be the ones in the middle, Cs will be the zeros on the right. Is that the position of the duck? Yeah, the duck's here. The duck's at the left end. Okay, and is A, B, and C other positions of the duck? Or? No, well, A, B, and C are like are like uh, the duck's going to go by them, and when it goes by them, it's going to turn them into, it's going to double them. As, here, let me explain. It's a good question. Here, here's what's going to happen. The duck's going to go from the left to the right. As the duck goes and it sees an A, it doubles the A. It puts an A. I see an A, I'm leaving two A's behind me. I see a B, keep going. I'm leaving two B's behind me. I see a C, I leave two C's behind me. I see the right end. Doo -doo. I see a C. Well, maybe at this point, it'll just go right back to the beginning. Let's make it nice and easy. It goes right back. It doesn't do anything. Now, again, sees an A, double the A. It sees another A. Not yet, right? It wants to add one A at a time, one B at a time, one C at a time. So the first A it sees, it doubles. And then it just passes through the rest of the A's. And it sees a B. It doubles. It passes through the rest of the B's. sees a C. Doubles it, passes through the rest of the C's, hits the right end, goes back to the left end. At any point along the way, if it makes it back to the left end, LD, then the LD will disappear. The A's will turn into zeros, the B's will turn into ones, and the C's will turn into zeros. So this grammar can only generate things if it makes it all the way through back to the beginning, and it leaves an equal number of A's, B's, and C's, and then those A's, B's, and C's can turn to zeros and ones. Now let me give you a sense. We're going to actually write the grammar, and we'll do a computation, so you'll see it. But I want to give you a sense of the difference between context-free and context-sensitive. The idea of moving the duck forward and thinking of this as a computation looks a little bit like this. It's a good example. Uh, LDA. What should LDA turn into? L, 